What is very surprising, Shuvo, in this entire episode is, and let's just step back and take another example. Let's take the Chit Fund case in Kolkata, where there was again a situation of an unregulated entity. The person concerned was arrested, interrogated. Now the nuances of whether the law was breached was look in, looked into. Now let's take this case. We've had one report after another. It keeps bringing up violations after violations. But I'm not even so sure whether the authorities have even visited the promoters of this exchange. Yes, so I mean it's uh, it's unfortunate, and I know I want to deal with this issue that there has been a lot of moral justification around the point that uh, investors went with their eyes wide open. There has been a certain parallel being drawn that when you get into markets, these are the risks. When you enjoy the profits, you enjoy the downside. I think all this is good, and it goes back to what I started with. I don't think. You know, there would be complaints from the investors, there may have been some noises, that, that there is a default. Now, there can be the stock market going down, there could, be a, there could be a situation when there are defaulters on the equities market. It has happened many times in India before. That does not trigger a government action. I think what I, what I think the picture is being missed is that here is a case where because of the fraud that has happened, because of the sheer manner and the criminality involved in the setup of the exchange and the way it operated, there was a sense of deception. There was a sense of representations given, which are now turning out to be false. I think it is not a question of whether you are high net worth or whether you are ordinary. The fact that such a system operated in the markets, I mean, you know, the commodities market and the financial markets are closely linked. The fact that such a market did operate uh, under an exemption, and the fact that the government is now kind of morally taking a position that these were high net worths, eyes wide open, I, I really think it's, it's not so appropriate because, uh, and your parallels to draw it with the Chit Fund case where the government's probably justifying it on the grounds that here were, uh, you know, less sophisticated, uh, you know, more investors which are gullible. But I think when there is fraud, you really can't distinguish between sophisticated versus unsophisticated. It's not a case of default, where I'm sympathetic to the argument the government makes, that there's a difference between a sophisticated and a less sophisticated investor. Let me draw a further parallel to such cases in the past. It's important to collect evidence before it gets destroyed. Let's take the Satyam case. The same night, you had authorities, SEBI officials to start with, other authorities landing up there at that office, sealing the computer, getting hold of documents. We don't seem to see that happening in this particular case at all. Yes, that is right. That is right. So I think uh, uh, it, it has not happened. So I think the investigation definitely did, did, doesn't have the, uh, the teeth and the sharpness that we had seen in the Satyam. And, and I thought, uh, you know, and maybe we were wrongly led to believe that that is the benchmark. Uh, and, and I think that's the sense of disappointment, that it's, it's, uh, it's not been followed to that alacrity that we had seen in, in, in Satyam. But, um, and again, in Satyam, I think the beauty of the Satyam was just not the investigation, but the fact that the asset was auctioned off in such a sophisticated manner uh, through a court process uh, from the company law board, exercising absolutely clear, well-laid-out legal provisions. And I think... Uh, 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 you know, that, that's been one of our uh, positions with the government is also that there are enough provisions in the, in the, in the law today. So, for example, uh, you know, the government has powers through the Ministry of Corporate Affairs to move the CLB and then to attach assets of uh, people who had knowledge of the fraud and who had participated in the fraud. The thresholds in the Companies Act is well laid out that people who had knowledge that the company's affairs were run in a fraudulent manner or had, and had participated in it, they are liable without limitation of liability. So, you know, the, the law provides for it. The central government has the powers to invoke these. There are precedents where uh, the central government has invoked this in the past in the case of Satyam uh, through an application before the CLB. So one of the things that, uh, you know, the investor community was very anxious about was that the, as there are enough assets to be attached. So 
here is a pool of assets of the owners of FTIL uh, that I'm not saying they need to be distributed to investors in the next 24 hours. That's not the, uh, the, the request. I think the request is to make sure that they are frozen, that, they are, that the value is preserved through them. Today we live in a state of affairs where those assets are pretty much free. And, uh, no, and there's always a risk of uh, dissipation on those assets. Similarly, for those 39 defaulters, uh, you know, I think you know, it's just a very few of the investors who would actually know their names and addresses and what kind of assets they have. Uh, the government may be seized of the issues. But I think the, the, the core of the matter rests in kind of attaching uh, their assets, making sure they are there, then having a longer investigation period. Nobody expects investigations to happen overnight. It's natural. It will take time. Uh, but when the investigation concludes, use those assets to, to do restitution through an auction process. Mm. So I think it's, it's, it's all there in the system. But, uh, and, you know, I'm still hopeful the government would exercise those powers as it gets deeper into the investigations. And uh, let's just see from there.